Okay, I want to welcome everybody to this uh, discussion of the book that Gabriela Raca and I um, co-edited, Joint Public Procurement and Innovation, Lessons Across Borders. Uh, we'll be talking about the book this morning and then talking about some of the lessons that it carries for us in, as we reflect on the pandemic. Um, this is part of a broader academic effort that was spearheaded by Jean Bernardo B. He launched it, and uh, we are all we are all very very grateful for what Jean Bernard was able to to set up, this set in motion, this this uh, incredible international enterprise we have now, sharing sharing ideas across borders. So we we are very very grateful to Jean Bernard, and very glad that he could join us today. Um, this session is going to be recorded and it'll be available um, on YouTube. It will also be linked in through my blog at publicprocurementinternational.com. And um, I, uh, during the course of the session, if people have questions, I'll be monitoring the chat room throughout. But please feel free if you want to ask questions of the panelists, you should feel free to just um, send me a note in the chat and we'll bring you up and you can go ahead and, 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 let you, and open up your video and go ahead and ask your questions. Okay, very good. Now, so this is the rough schedule we'll be following. We're going to have an introduction from uh, Professor Rock and myself. And then with discussants, we'll have Caroline Nicholas from the, uh, from Antitra, Rosanne Nogolou from the University of Paris, Paolo Magino from OECD, Stefan De La Rosa from the University of Paris as well. We're going to have observations. Gabriela Rocca and I will, will offer, if there's time, we'll offer a short observation at that point. But most importantly, we'll have observations from Laurence Folio-Lalio and Jean Bernard Duby. Gabriela, did you have something? My sound? Okay. Yes, I will the more, sound is bad, sorry. I will speak more clearly. So I'll start with the introductions. Gabriela Raca joins us from the University of Turin. She and I co-edited this book. This is the second book that we edited together. Um, under the auspices of the initiative of, that launched by Jean Bernardo B, the professor's initiative, the academic initiative in public contracts. Um, Gabriela is a professor at the University of Turin, and those of you who don't know me, I'm a professor at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Gabriela, you want to give a little background on the book? Well, do you want? Uh, sure. Could you talk a little bit about the background for the book? Ah, okay. The background of the book. Yes, sure. It's a great group that we put together of colleagues through the uh, network of Jean Bernardo B, and we have this uh, cooperation cross-border and cross-transatlantic uh, cooperation. And so we had the, the idea of uh, discussing uh, these uh, these topics around a few conferences around the world, and then putting together the, the book. It was a, such a, a hard work that now that it is finished, we want uh, to submit it to the, all the academic community, the practitioner community to discuss and to have feedbacks on this. So I'm uh, really happy today to, to have the chance to, of hearing someone who, who had the, 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 the the effort <laughs> because the book is quite, uh, uh, quite long and quite, uh, um, go deep in the, in the subject. So we have the idea of uh, sharing now with uh, all the public that will follow us and all, all the, also the one that will uh, listen and to this uh, presentation afterwards uh, to go on and to receive feedbacks uh, in order to have the chance to continue this research. Very challenging and very interesting on cross-border procurement in Europe, cross-border procurement in the US and innovation and all the aspect of cooperation, administrative cooperation, that I think really we anticipated, we will, uh, we will see and we will discuss afterwards uh, what really we need in the future of procurement uh, in the next year after the pandemic realizes. So for, for the moment uh, it's enough, so uh, you can go through the slides quickly if you want, but I really look forward to hearing our colleagues and friends uh, talking about what we wrote and uh, all the efforts of this year will, uh, will be in, um, in, the, in their words. So we will see if we did something uh, useful. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you, Gabriela. So I just want to highlight for the audience some interesting chapters out of the book. And the, the book is available for sale on the La Sierra website, but it's also available on publicprocurementinternational.com. I took selected chapters from the book and placed them um, on publicprocurementinternational.com. Also, the embargo will lift on the book in November, 
and we hope to make it more publicly available at that point to make it more accessible for researchers. Just some of the things that the, the chapter that was done by Ms. Asad Triyan is a very interesting chapter on emerging developments in Armenia and Far East in the Far Eastern Europe um, in terms of how those states under association agreements are approaching their responsibilities uh, potentially under the uh, European directives. Uh, Jean-Bernard Aubi and um, Laurence Folio-Lalio and Peter McKean, all of whom are here today, they wrote on issues of smart cities. Um, uh, Ms. Diesing and um, Paolo Magina, and Paolo Magina is with us today, they wrote on the new maps, um, approach the new diagnostic tool that's, that's put forward by OECD for assessing procurement systems. Um, the um, Justin Kaufman, who is with us today as well, he wrote on cooperative purchasing, and I'm going to be talking about cooperative purchasing in the United States in just a second. Ivo Locatelli talked about um, the role of uh, the European Commission in uh, overall guidance for the member states in Europe. A very interesting question is, as we move towards the next generation of issues in Europe, which will probably be issues of contract administration. Shelly Molino, who's also with us today, from she's a graduate student at the University of Turin. She was previously a student with us in uh, George Washington University. She wrote on issues of sustainability. These are just some of the chapters, which are which are very very interesting. I, I do want to just draw one final one to your attention. Um, the one done that I the co chapter that I co-wrote with a former student, Crystal Santer Funderburg. Uh, Crystal did something very interesting. She put onto my website the link there. You can see that she did a short introductory video for her chapter. That's a tool that's used more and more now in the United States. As people write articles and chapters, the academics will give a short video introduction to their chapter or to their article as a teaching tool for, for students who are reading the material. So it's an, it's an interesting, interesting pedagogical tool. Um, the, the book is here on my, on my uh, website, Public Procurement International. It's, there's the, you can just link from it down to the book, it's down to the chapters itself. Um, I have had to retool my, my website since, we, um, since the, Black Lives Matter, the summer of Black Lives Matter. So I no longer focus on George Washington for, for obvious historical reasons. But just for, for those of you who wonder why I have this picture up here too, the, the men on the bottom who are rowing um, George Washington across the Delaware, those are men from my hometown. This is, this is the foundation of the American Navy from Marblehead Mass. These are John Glover and his men pushing, John, pushing George Washington across the Delaware for an attack on the, uh, on the British. Um, the, the, this is the, uh, these are the chapters that are available. They are available to download from the website. And this is an experiment in trying to make our research more readily available uh, to the public. And these are the main topics that we'll be discussing today from the book, issues of cross-border procurement, smart cities, encouraging innovation, innovation in the procurement process. I think the two topics that will be most relevant to our discussion today are the issues of cross-border procurement and innovation. And I think uh, I'm very much looking forward to Paula Magino's presentation on issues of, of innovation as they've emerged out of the pandemic. Um, so one of the things we talked about, we wanted to focus on in the book, was the issue of how you handle joint procurement, how you handle what the United States would call cooperative purchasing, which is purchasing done between different states. We historically, we had viewed, we had focused on this partly as an anti-corruption tool, because if we can have a school teacher, for example, in a very corrupt state, um, be able to buy things from a, for, for example, from an electronic catalog in Denmark, which is a relatively clean state, that school teacher can bypass local corruption and get the best value for, for, for her students. So the, the idea is to use cooperative purchasing as a way or in joint procurement as a way of getting around local dysfunctions in the procurement process. In the pandemic, as we'll see though in just a minute, this, this whole question was turned upside down. In the directive from 2014 in the European Union, uh, the European Union recognized the importance of joint procurement and specifically said that member states shall not prohibit co uh, contracting authorities from being able to use centralized purchasing authorities contracts from other states. So Article 39 of the 2014 Directive very much opened the door to what we in the, in the United States call cooperative purchasing. By the way, Justin Kaufman works on a day-to-day -day basis in cooperative purchasing. So his perspective in the book were very, very useful. But so we see parallel development here in Europe as in the United States, encouraging the use of cooperative purchasing or joint procurement across borders. 
the practical problems that come out of that, we, we've dealt with in more detail in previous presentations. So I want to just focus on one here because it really was a critical, it started as a legal question, which was if you have a centralized purchasing agency in France and a contracting entity in Germany is using the contract from France, whose law applies? Should it be the procuring entity in Germany or should it be the law of the centralized purchasing agency in France. And before the pandemic, this was kind of a jump ball, as we say in, in the United States, using a basketball metaphor. We really weren't sure whose law should apply. The practical outcome in the United States is that the local purchasing entity, they insist on applying their own law if at all possible. And the vehicle that I'll be talking about in just a minute, the, the cooperative purchasing vehicle in the United States accommodates that, allows local the local purchasing entity to apply its own rules regarding transparency, regarding um, competition and regarding socioeconomic requirements. So the US rule was you move to where the money is, to where the procurement actually is, and you apply the local law. While in, the, in Europe, it's a closer question. It may be that the, central, the law of the centralized purchasing entity in France, in our example, would be the law that applies. And, and I, I think that the pandemic showed the danger with that approach. But this is something that we struggle with in the book. We had, in the book, we had two voices. We had voices from, we had, we had voices from Europe and we had voices from the United States trying to deal with these questions of where the, which law would apply. So in, in the United States under the, the, and the most prominent example of cooperative purchasing in the United States among public entities, one's called NASPO Value Point. And NASPO is the National Association of State Purchasing Officers. And they have a vehicle called Value Point that can be used across all the states. So here's just an example. I, I use Alabama and Wisconsin. As, as my colleagues know, I use these pictures to show this basic truth of American culture, which is that every state capital in America looks exactly the same. <laughs> it's kind of funny. But, the, but in the, the, from this example, Minnesota, which runs an IT contract, has runs a master contract can be used by Alabama, Wisconsin, other states. The Alabama, Wisconsin, if Wisconsin orders from this contract and this cooperative purchasing contract, they have the local demand, they, they, they control the supply chain. And I'm gonna be returning to that issue in just a second. And they have legal control as well. Under the contractual structure sponsored by Value Point, Wisconsin can impose its own legal rules on these purchases, which turns out to be really important because during the pandemic, what happened is we had a split. We had state and local governments and constitutionally, I really wanna emphasize this point, states have first constitutional responsibility for the health and welfare of their people in the United States. Under our federalist system, there's no question about that, that states have, and in fact, the Trump administration shirked responsibility in the pandemic. They, there's a piece in Vanity Fair. They consciously pushed political accountability to the state level in order to avoid Trump responsibility, Trump accountability for the debacle we have now, where just so you know, at this particular point in history, Europe has as many dead as the United States, but it has twice as many people. Twice as many people live in, the Europe, in Europe as in the United States, but it has the same number of deaths. So our death rate is, tw is roughly twice that of Europe. And it's been a, it's a political and practical disaster. What happened is the, and there's a very interesting piece, I wanna recommend it to you by one of our, one of our colleagues is doing, a, is doing research with us through NASPA on what happened, his name's Rob Hanfield. He's a professor at North Carolina State. He's a, he's a supply chain professor. And he and other academics in this space did a study, they were allowed in to assess the national stockpile. It's an emergency stockpile set up after the 9-11 attacks here in the United States. And the national stockpile was set up to address terrorist attacks. It was not prepared to address a pandemic. The national stockpile failed. So there were not enough emergency supplies and the Trump administration, as the states were very aggressively negotiating for, and bring sourcing, bringing into the country PPE, other emergency supplies. The Trump administration, FEMA, used its authorities under the Defense Production Act to grab those supplies. And there, these are just a few of the of the scores of articles on this. And if you talk to people in the industry, they say, "Yeah, you know, I, I had a supply pulled as well." So 
by controlling the customs service at the border, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Administration, the Trump administration were able to grab the supplies and move them elsewhere in the country, which is very controversial here in the United States. So we had a split between who was responsible, which was the states, who was doing the sourcing, which was the states, and then the people who had the political and legal power, which is the federal government. Okay. So a split. This strongly suggests that in a situation like this, when, when in a procurement process or cooperative purchasing process, which I now call uncooperative purchasing, as it turned every the pandemic turned everything on its head, that the entity that is politically accountable, that is actually doing the sourcing, that entity should also have legal control. And it's important to preserve and respect that entity's legal control, because otherwise, unless you have an incredibly inclusive and good leadership in the other entity, in this case, the federal government, controlling the process, which we don't have. We have very divisive leadership. If you don't have that, not only will you have a breakdown of the procurement process, but you'll have a breakdown of the overall political and social process. That's what's happening here. This has important ramifications for how we proceed. And this is my, gonna be my last substantive slide, okay? Peter McKean is with us today, wrote about amazon.gov. Just so you know, on June 26th, the US federal government awarded contracts for an estimated $6 billion to Amazon Business, Overstock.com, Fisher Scientific. Amazon's the main player in this. These contracts will allow on a no, it's, these are no cost contracts. There's no cost to the centralized purchasing agency, the General Services Administration. These, co these contracts will allow users to make purchases up to $10,000. So non-contracting officials will be able to buy things like masks directly from Amazon. It is a private supply chain alternative to a public supply chain, to public procurement. Essentially at the micro-purchase level, we're outsourcing the procurement function. What this highlights is, is it, it forces us to focus on private supply chain risk management theory. This is a well-established theory. And I've just chosen here on the left-hand side, I've chosen one of the ways to break down supply chain management theory through operations risk, financial risk, physical risk, strategic risk. This is just one way of assessing supply chain risk. On the right-hand side is a public supply chain, public procurement supply chain. And the question over the next 20 years, by the way, the question on which all our jobs depend, because if the public procurement regime evaporates, then there'll be no place for public procurement law professors, okay? <laughs> if the, the, public, the public regime on the right-hand side always has an additional element of risk, and the pandemic really highlighted that, there's political and legal risk. And the political and legal risk has social ramifications. How does the public respond to the way the public supply chain is reacting to a particular emergency or a particular need? That risk has to be minimized because if the risk isn't minimized, then on the left-hand side, the private supply chain will always win. This really throws into new contrast. We have a new understanding. Amazon resists public requirements in amazon.gov like like a, like a rash, it fights every step of the way to keep public requirements out of Amazon, out of its, the, the, the website that it will proffer to public buyers. I thought that was because Amazon was trying to avoid the costs that public requirements bring with them. Increasingly, I believe that Amazon understands this chart. Amazon understands that the more we bring public requirements into their supply chain, the more we're adding another element of risk, they want to avoid that. And I think the proof is actually in Amazon.gov right now. That initiative, contracts award on June 26, the contracts were supposed to be alive within 30 days, July 26, they are not live. And I believe the reason they are not live is because at the same time, the Trump administration has launched an anti-Huawei ban. Huawei has to be pulled out of the supply chain. And I believe that the best explanation for why those contracts have not gone live on schedule is because Amazon and the other vendors and the General Service Administration are struggling with the Huawei ban. They are struggling with a political and legal risk that is injected into what is normally a private supply chain. Okay, that's it for me. And I'm gonna turn it over to our discussants. Caroline, Caroline Nicholas is, for those of you who don't know, Caroline is the, she hates it when I say this, <laughs> but she effectively was 
the, the, the woman who helped bring about the UNCITRAL model law, the UNCITRAL model on public procurement. She and I worked it from uh, roughly 2003 to 2011 to the finalization of the public of the um, model procurement law. And then Caroline worked and continued to work with us um, on the, the guide to enactment. The, the model law itself, the revised model law in 2011 looks, it's about the same size as the 1994 version. So they, we, we all knew that that had to be done. Caroline, incredibly, wrote a 300-page guide to enactment, which I use in my teaching all the time. She wrote a 300-page guide to enactment to go with it. So she really charted the way forward in this international harmonization of, of public procurement law. We really owe her a great debt. She's been kind enough to join us today to talk about the book. And Caroline, what I'll do is I'll advance the slides for you. I'm going to go on mute. You just tell me as I should advance the slides. That's great. Thanks very much, Chris, and thank you to you and to Gabriella and everybody else for the opportunity to talk today. Um, you will have noticed I didn't contribute anything to the book, and that's because joint procurement um, in answer trials model law is mentioned once. Um, the model law, as Chris indicated, was drafted um, a long time ago now, so we were really doing this in the uh, 2000s. And joint procurement then was noted as something that we might want to talk about in the future. So our model law doesn't exclude it because we, we allow a very flexible definition of the procuring entity or contracting authority or buying agency, whatever you might like to call it, which would allow for joint, uh, a joint participants, but, but it, it doesn't really go any further. Um, I've read the book in, in detail and I really, really enjoyed it. And it, I call it a glass half full book. What it's showing is that the old statement that public procurement is full of people who don't ever innovate and we like to do things the way we always did do them is simply no longer the case. It's showing um, a sort of multidisciplinary approach, which I think is really important because lawyers should not be driving the procurement revolution, if I can uh, call it that. Um, we really need to be talking with the people who are actually engaged in making this thing work and this is actually an approach that that we um follow in answer trial as chris said the the, the things that are really important um to, to listen just to, to, to note from what he said was it was done in the un forum it took us eight years just to issue an, a model law and that's because we spent a huge amount of time looking at practice which is why chris and, and some of uh, his colleagues and so on were involved because we started from practice and went to policy and this is what I really liked about the book, because it was example focused. It didn't start from theorizing, it started from what is actually happening on the ground. And I put on the slide here four things that I really took out from, from the book, um, and, and really talking about innovation as, as new ways of doing things. And you, I'm not going to repeat what I've said on the slides, but you, uh, on the slide, but you can see here, it's a very all-encompassing notion of innovation and what I've highlighted there in, in bold is the concept of working collaboratively because what I found was the theme throughout the book was collaboration it's the sharing of ideas not just in how the book came about but also um, in, in, in the examples that it gave what was looking at working well came about because of collaboration so it's not just joint procurement but it's a really deep-seated collaboration and that's a, a big theme um, that I want to, to talk about, and it's something that underpins Antitrail, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, the point there about diversifying sl supply chains, as Chris has highlighted, the pandemic showed us just how important that, that, was, uh, that was going to be. And indeed, in many ways, it was quite prophetic what was, what was said about what would happen if you didn't diversify your supply chains in a pandemic hit. Um, the other thing I really like is this idea of innovation which is not the government focused industrial policy. Uh, at a purely personal level, I'm not speaking for UNCITRAL here, I'm a huge cynic about industrial policy. I've not found very many governments that get do it very well. You get the occasional exception, but I'm, I'm not a great fan of it, though I know governments do it. So what I really liked was the idea in here that was shown is that there's recognizing that small enterprises um, are nimble and they often have very good um, innovative ideas. And traditionally, as we all know, they find it very difficult to take part in procurement. So the, the sort of sub points here that I've got, um, the small business support in the US and the launch customer and the early adopter approach in the EU, so that you're given effectively markets, guarantees of markets or guarantees of sales, 
uh, to some degree, which encourage businesses to, to take part, I think are really, really important. Uh, offer the opportunity to scale up, which we're going to know, see is so important in the pandemic um, um, recovery. And all of this shows the idea that, that we are so fond of in UNSATRAL, which is problem-based procurement methods and practices. I mean, that's, that's what we like to look at as how you develop policy. And we do develop policy before we put it in law, and I think it's so, so important. The cultural shift to the supply side of, as, as innovators, as Laurence, who's worked in our, our area of uh, PPPs a lot, will know, this is not new in our, our world, but the emphasis here is, is so welcome because it's at the smaller level. And I, I, I thought of some, some examples, they're not from the book, but I was listening to a podcast the other day about Small Business Innovation Awards, um, in the UK, as you can hear, that's where I come from originally. And they were talking about um, a little company, tiny company, that was using honeycomb paper to make pallets. And as the pandemic hit, they turned it into uh, desks for people doing home working. Just, just like that. And, and it, it's, it was a, a really short and innovative turnaround. Companies started to put together um, content for handheld education. Again, Lot of kids are uh, having to work from, from home. Um, and then at the other end of the scale, um, some um, software to de deliver, and I don't understand how, um, battery electricity to electric buses at the local level. And these things, they'd never work at a national level. If you were trying to call this a national level, it requires the sort of city level approach, which um, the, 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 the smart cities um, was looking at things from a slightly different perspective. But I think this scale is so important. So that's the sort of glass half full. Chris, if you could go to the next slide, please. So my role here today is to be Mrs. Glass Half Empty. And um, what is it that's stopping us achieve some of the potential that so many of these good examples gave us uh, in the book have shown it, uh, is, is possible. And we know about collaboration and the essence of it here um, in our world is that it's voluntary for both parties in the procurement cycle, it's voluntary for everybody. We know in addition to the benefits in terms of outcomes, um, uh, that's the commercial benefits, the experience of collaboration in experience sharing that central purchasing agencies or central purchasing bodies can, can show is really important in terms of process, uh, inefficiencies and so forth, and the key role of data for demonstrating how well the things are working, that's very clear. But these benefits, which we know have to be set against the time and costs of collaboration. And here, this is very much why Ansatral does the work it does. How much does it cost you to find out how you can solve the problems about doing things in a collaborative way? If you want to sell into another country, what have you got to learn about the legal regime, about the regulatory regime, about other barriers? That's a cost um, and it takes time. And as we so aptly put in the book, if you don't get um, your, your innovative products out on time, then they, they don't work. So this is, these are challenges, I think, that we have to tackle. And the first, and I think a really important one, is about legal relationships. And, and Chris, mentioned, uh, Chris mentioned these. Um, the, the concept of horizontal collaboration, so between partners, like central purchasing agencies across borders, those raise one set of, of um, uh, legal issues I'll look at in a minute. We've also got to think about the vertical relationships, the cost of transferring knowledge between end users and procuring entities and centralised purchasing agencies and, and suppliers. That's a time and cost involved there. And we need to make sure that the legal relationships are really clear. So for example, um, are you clear when you're engaging in market consultations? And are you making sure that the way that you're doing that won't stop the suppliers that you're consulting take part in subsequent procurement? Do you have clear understandings about relationships between the procuring entities and the central purchasing agencies? Now, for those of you in Europe and the US who've been involved with these sorts of things, those issues are fairly well settled. But in other countries, it's much more of a challenge. One of the things I want to note here is as Eva Locatello so aptly said, public procurement remains highly regulated. And that's not just the procurement rules. There are lots of other legal arrangements that we need to take into account. So if you're going to create a joint purchasing entity, you can do it under an international agreement. 
and then you you set this is uh, up with a for example um, an agreed law chris mentioned choice of law uh, clauses so that that can be done um but what about the contracts you might issue under it do we know exactly how those are going to work if as chris mentioned you create a group with a lead procuring entity based in one state can all other bodies actually join in the eu rules say you can't stop contracting authorities buying but what about getting together in this way there's some indications in some examples i've read that those can still be a problem Whose law works for procurement procedure? If you've got two stages under a framework agreement, they may differ under the constitutional document. But what does that mean if the second stage simply applies the terms of the first stage? And this matters because if you've got contracts and disputes, you've got to work out whose choice of law, uh, who, whose law is going to apply. Now, choice of law is a real issue and we can spend hours and hours discussing it and we don't want to do that now. The answer trial approach is to create substantive private law rules so that everybody follows the same rules so it doesn't matter so much whose law applies and that's one approach that I think is very helpful for this but it is very difficult when you're doing that across across um, significant borders uh, the EU context there is a lot of convergence going on but it's still not a hundred percent states and federal we know in the US have ongoing problems of this sort and then we have to look at how this might apply outside um, and one sort of particularly practical point I just want to raise, um, you've got joint responsibility and lead agency responsibility, which you might have in a, a, in a, a joint procuring uh, arrangement. But there's theory and practice, because if you say X lead agency carries responsibility, but it relies on its partner because the partner can read documents in a particular language, then is there really complete lead agency responsibility? Because if things go wrong, no doubt, there will be some problems arising because one org organization has relied on another. And so what I'm talking about here generally is the concepts of trust and risk that we know are particularly uh, critical in running public procurement systems. That's what our rules are designed to do, we're designed to mitigate risk and to allow for trust between the parties. Next slide please, Chris. So, Going beyond the, the concept of, of legal issues, we want to look at the, the policy areas. One of the big challenges I see here, and I hope that we might be looking at it very seriously on the policy perspective, is since the financial crisis, which seems a very, very long time ago now, um, we've had a, a focus, a short-term focus on value for money, administrative efficiency, um, and indeed, the key benefits of digitization and centralization are really focusing around those in the public procurement sphere. Innovative procurement involves costs and it involves risks. There's a, a clearly an inherent policy tension here, and there's no right answer to it, but we have to recognize it. And you can't have all things at the same time. And in terms of um, the, the, the pandemic, what, 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 what we learned here, um, just in time is basically our delivery model, keeping costs down, looking to just in case, what should we buy just in case we need them for a future pandemic. I think Chris might have started this uh, terminology. I think it's a very helpful one. And what is, has COVID-19 actually led us to think about the acceptance of a more qualitative approach in a longer term view that would allow us to say, actually the costs of innovation and the costs of setting up these collaborations, we think are acceptable in the longer term, and we will bear the short term costs. Now, there's no right answer to that, obviously, but it's a question that has not really been asked in recent years, and I think is going to become very important. At a more detailed level, where we have less formal collaboration between suppliers, we know that there can be risks to competition, and we have to have some very clear standards about how we're going to do that. Um, to allow for that. We can have formal joint ventures, yes, and I'm, I've read about framework alliances and so forth, and I would like to know a little bit more about how those work and address the risk, ever-present risk of bid rigging. In oligopolistic markets, that's always a problem. Similarly, and as I indicated some time ago, um, when you're doing market research is one stage of the process. When you're doing procurement, starting with the advertisement and so on, is another. Is there a clear demarcation and do we have proper arrangements to make sure that collaboration at one stage doesn't mean you can't take part later on? 
some systems do, some systems don't. And finally here, risk aversion. Um, the SMEs um, experience that we have, and, uh, and I've, I've written about this before, and particularly with one of our colleagues who's just sent me a note, um, who's on the, on the uh, call, uh, call at uh, Jean-Luigi Albano, Albano, sorry. Um, SMEs research, and particularly in the public procurement framework agreements concept, we know that procurement officials are co inherently conservative. I don't mean that in a negative way, but they are risk averse because their systems are risk averse risks are not appreciated in the system and so we need to have a more um, grown up if you can put it that way approach to risk sharing at an at a very senior level we know about contractual mechanisms but we need to replicate those sorts of things in the in the um, overall system now i'm running out of time and i just want to come up with a couple of conclusions after just highlighting the practical considerations that i've put at the bottom of this slide um, I think that, that these practical issues, languages and so forth, cross-border recognition, reliance on others um, in the context of can you trust somebody else to have done the job properly if you're actually responsible for doing it? And we found in particular in the Caribbean that uh, cross-reliance on other suppliers lists for qualification purposes has simply not worked in practice. Um, to, to go down to the next slide, to draw some of these things together in terms of a conclusion, um, one of the things that, that we really want to highlight here is most of these problems aren't new. We need to think about them. We need to, to look at the benefits of harmonization, modernization in terms of making sure that the tools that the most sophisticated have come up with are available to others and recognize that we need a toolbox approach to ensure both that they're appropriate tools and to make sure that they're sufficient, that they can transfer uh, to developing countries in particular. And then I think we also have to recognize the stuff that we can't control. Um, closed borders, people being authorized simply just to avoid the rules, avoid the processes and political relations. And here in UNCITRAL, um, what we try and do is encourage people to say, we're going to compromise. We're not going to insist on our best solution. We're going to, to collaborate and actually accept what we can accept and work from that rather than insisting on our, our, our primacy if you like and that's very challenging and I hope that those sorts of debates will come up in the future as we look at, at uh, taking our currently challenging economic and social environment forward. Thanks very much Chris. Thanks Caroline, that was excellent, yeah thank you very much. <laughs> so, would you like to chime in? Uh, is Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first thing, uh, I really want to thank uh, Gabriela and Chris for inviting me uh, to talk today. And I also want to congratulate them because they did a terrific job. And all the people who contributed to this book, it's a very, very interesting book. It's a very innovating book. <laughs> I mean, it's the first time I've read anything like that. And uh, you ha there are so many ideas in this book. It's really, very really great. So congratulations to both of you for this uh, awesome work, really. <laughs> so, I, I'm, well, um, so I, I just wanted to talk about, like, sh I, I'm going to be short, and I, I just want to talk about one topic uh, which I found very interesting. I mean, I, oh, the whole book is really interesting, but uh, one thing um, I found interesting was um, a paper about innovation partnership. Uh, because that's something which appeared to be quite new when it first emerged, you know, it was a new idea and um, to have like a new kind of contract. And uh, the idea was to find an efficient way for research and development contracts. I mean, to find something that would work because it didn't work before that. Uh, why? But, well, you know, because after the research phase, it was impossible to buy the products or services or goods from the people who actually did the research. So it was, um, I mean, we had to find a way uh, to, for companies to be part of the research phase and then be able to get the contracts to, uh, for the goods, uh, services or um, other products. So. And that uh, we needed another solution, and that was 
why we create we had these innovation partnerships and uh, there is uh, one paper about uh, this subject in your book which is really really interesting and as shown in this book um, it shows that it's a great idea it's a very good idea but it doesn't fulfill all the promises that we put maybe into innovation partnerships and I think it shows that uh, innovation is a tricky thing and it's uh, tricky when it's in relation with public procurements because we need to find ways to encourage research, to encourage uh, innovation. But at, at the same time, we have all these rules about procurement contracts and sometimes both, of, both these ideas don't go very well together. And that's uh, also, I think, what innovation partnership shows, even though, and I just wanted to say that, and I, I, mean, I will, um, first I will try to make some points about innovation partnerships, and then maybe at the end show that, well, it has been used uh, a little bit in France, and, well, to say what we did with it, and maybe it will be used more, I, I don't know, but I, I just wanted to say, because um, the paper, um, the conclusion of the paper is uh, that it's made for big innovation, and I, I'm not completely sure. Uh, it has been used in France for small innovation as well. So well, let's see what happens. But first, um, so it, it was uh, the problem with um, innovation partnership is uh, first the, the scope uh, of the contract. Um, one of the conditions is that uh, the solution, uh, solution on the market do not meet uh, the procurement need. That's uh, a condition. Uh, to use this innovation partnership. So uh, first, the contracting authority needs to know the market to make sure that it, uh, the solution you want to buy is innovative, that there is nothing else on the market. And that's actually hard to prove. I mean, you need to have studies, uh, to have sourcing, to find a way to prove that uh, what you want to buy is actually an innovative product that you can't find anything else on the market. And the market, at least in Europe, is the EU market. So you have to make sure that really you can find anything else. And the problem is that that can be challenged in court. I mean, if you use an innovation, um, a partnership, and someone challenged your contract and it showed that you couldn't use it because there was something on the market. Uh, so there is an element of risk. Uh, in using this contract. And when there is an element of risk for a contracting authority, it can be a deterrent, you know, like, okay, maybe I should use something easier and have like two phases, the research phase, and then um, buying as a product, which is not the same thing, of course, as uh, innovation partnership. Uh, the second point um, is the performance of the contract. And for the performance of the contract as well, um, some questions do arise and they're linked to the fact that it's an innovation contract. I mean, it's about an innovative uh, product. Um, th well, the contracts, uh, the innovation partnership contracts has three phases, the research, the development, and as uh, a purchase. And you don't have to go uh, up to the end. It really depends on what the contracting authority wants to do. And one other question I think, um, and I don't have an answer to that, is how you can modify this kind of contract. Because, you know, you're talking about um, innovative uh, services, something new, something that has never been done. Otherwise, you can't use this contract. And if it has never been done, then it will need to be adapted at some point. You know it's going to need some changes at some point during the performance phase. And at the same time, we have a very strict rules about um, modification, contract modification under EU law and obviously under French law. So it, it's not very easy to combine these two ideas, to, uh, the, um, meaning that you, will, you know you will need to uh, modify your contract at some point. And at the same time, while it's very hard to modify a procurement contract under EU law. So that's, that can be a challenge and it needs to be thought well ahead to have like rendezvous clause or things like that to adapt the contract, I guess. But I, I don't know if you can like really think about absolutely uh, everything. 
obviously, uh, as shown uh, in the book, and that's shown in the book in like many paper, many um, papers actually, uh, well, the IP rights question is a very important one, and it's a very important one for this kind of contracts as well. And you have to make sure that IP rights are protected and to make sure as well, because you know the contracting authority is buying something and it needs to get what it's buying, meaning it can also, um, it, it will need sometimes to buy the IP rights. So that's, that's, that can be a challenge and it also needs to be sought well in advance. Um, so another point maybe that can be made before I give you some examples of the use of this kind of contract uh, in France is, oh, well, the question is, is it really a partnership and how, I mean, what's a partnership about? And uh, because, you know, sometimes we talk about a public-private partnership and that's something really different from the innovation partnership. So the term partnership entails that while well, you're working with um, uh, the con both contracting uh, bodies are working together, I'm not completely sure that's what's going on. And I, I don't know if the term partnership uh, is actually the good one to describe as this kind of, of contract. So um, last thing I wanted to point out uh, in relation to what the book is saying um, is that well, this contract has been used. I mean, there has been uh, some examples of um, uh, innovation partnerships uh, in France, and I'm sure there have been in other countries as well. So, and I, I, I was curious, I was like, well, what has it been used for? Who used this contract? Actually, it's quite interesting. It's been used in many, many different um, uh, settings. I mean, it's been used by SNCF. SNCF is our big uh, railroad operators, but it has used this contract to buy the train of the future. That's the name of it. I, I don't know. I mean, what it means exactly, but it's supposed to be uh, a trend that will use less electricity. So, like, so it has uh, um, innovation partnership with Alstom, which is a very big company, which um, builds a train as well. So that's, that was a very big contract, uh, obviously, but it's also been used and that's in relation to the book as well. Uh, by um, small size uh, cities in France for to develop the smart cities projects. So it has always also been used in that respect. And that's, you know, a smaller scope contract. It's not a very big one for like a new kind of train in France. It's something which is smaller and it has been used uh, for, uh, as on its, uh, it's not like the city of Paris uh, wanted to do a small city in Paris. It's small cities wanted to do something small, sometimes for neighborhood, and it has been used um, in that respect as well. It has also been used by, um, we have um, our defense um, ministry uh, has an agency which is called the Innovation Agency of the Defense um, Ministry and has been used uh, by this uh, innovation agency as well. For small contracts, actually, for, to design new things, uh, new weapons, I guess, sometimes. Uh, but uh, it's not like always very, very big contracts. And last thing, um, it has, and I think it's really interesting, and it's uh, in relation to, well, it was, um, uh, the contract was entered into before the pandemic, but it can be in relation with the pandemic. Uh, it has been used by um, our education um, ministry. Uh, to develop uh, artificial intelligence a way of teaching uh, and to develop um, well virtual learning actually so that was before <laughs> the pandemic but I thought it was really interesting to see that we had this idea of developing new way of teaching and uh, using the uh, intellig uh, artificial intelligence in the classroom actually and that uh, so this contract uh, unfortunately the contract uh, is not completely performed so i don't know where we are with this contract when we do need it because uh, we needed it in the spring and we're going to need it um, i'm afraid again this fall but that's also uh in this area we have used um innovation partnership so i think uh, what i want uh, that's why i wanted to finish with uh, these examples it shows that um was this kind of contract Maybe tricky. I mean, it's not very easy to use. There are flaws, but it, I mean, it's, it's been used and we see how it goes. And if it is successful, um, maybe, I mean, that would be a new tool um, for the future, we'll see.
So I, that, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I just to, and, and to compare it, Rosen, to the, the U.S. experience, the, the U.S. is called, they're called small business innovation research projects, and the, the innovative partnerships have in some ways been successful, but as you point out, there's also constraints. And one of the things that we worry about in the United States is, as you point out, having an early identification of a requirement, but then if you tie that to production, that may mean that the conception of what's the best technology today could be tied to a single producer who takes advantage of the Small Business Innovation Research Project 10 years from now. And that, that creates there's some distortions in the competitive process too. Of course, of course, yes. So thank you very much. I'm going to switch over to Paolo from the OECD. Paolo, the floor is yours. Hello. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be among such uh, distinguished uh, guests. And it was my pleasure and Lena's to collaborate in the, um, in the book. The book is really interesting. And uh, if uh, Caroline is Miss uh, Glass of Empty, I will be Mr. Elephant in the Room because I don't have a, a, a degree in law and I'm not an academic. So I will try to bring you a different uh, perspective. Um, I will try to, um, to show you how uh, OECD countries reacted to the, to the pandemic. And um, also by bringing these examples, I think uh, they will show how the book was timely and how we managed to anticipate some of the uh, existing challenges in terms of procurement. So Chris, if you could move on to the slides. Yeah, so the next one is uh, uh, the first one that I would like to um, talk to you about. So uh, in the past six months, we've been collecting a lot of evidence on the way uh, the uh, OECD countries reacted to the pandemic. Uh, we facilitated the dialogue and on our website, you can see the recorded sessions of the webinars that we uh, developed together with um, uh, many uh, representatives from the, uh, our delegates and OECD countries. And uh, we looked not just on the public procurement dimensions, but we looked also uh, to the infrastructure uh, response and the governance of infrastructure. Since the beginning of the year, we are um, uh, doing this together. So uh, infrastructure and public procurement were brought together uh, to OECD because uh, we understood that uh, public procurement uh, frameworks were used to deliver uh, infrastructure uh, projects and the relevance of uh, infrastructure is also important for public service delivery. Um, for that reason, we uh, produced a stock taking report on the, the public procurement uh, and infrastructure responses. And more than that, we developed a, a policy brief that um, is also trying to um, explain how countries will use the lessons learned from the, the pandemic into their own uh, procurement thinking. And in the next slide, I put um, some of the challenges that um, the public buyers experienced. And uh, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with uh, most of these challenges. Um, it's just a list that uh, highlights uh, uh, what we have been facing uh, in the recent uh, past. So uh, if we start by looking at um, the, the purchasing environment. I don't think any of us were, was prepared to uh, deal with what happened. And that uh, put a lot of uh, um, pressure on emergency contracting frameworks that were never tested to this extent. And uh, many countries had to uh, revise, had to update, or had to use them to, uh, as, as much as possible. But um, now in the future, we will see that the emergency contracting frameworks will have to be redesign and, and readapt. And in the previous presentations, we already uh, heard about um, the fierce competition, uh, not going to the level of uh, maybe uh, the war level that uh, Chris was mentioning in the US. But uh, uh, in, in uh, many countries, we saw public buyers uh, fighting for the same uh, products and services um, in different levels of government, and that created a, a, a disruption and a, a different way of, of dealing with it. Um, at the same time, we heard about the supply chain disruptions that occurred in, in many countries. And um, just this morning, I was talking to Oslo, uh, and the city of Oslo told me that uh, in March, when the pandemic started, they had um, two days, two days of supplies for protective equipment, and other stuff that was needed for the pandemic. 
and um, and and they couldn't deal with that, and uh, many products were stopped uh, at the Swedish border. They they tried to get uh, more uh, stock in, and they couldn't because the the borders were closed, and so there were serious disruptions. And they uh, somehow they adapted and changed their uh, procurement procedures, and now they have uh, several months of. Uh, um, supplies uh, in-house. So th this is a clear effect of, of the, the crisis. Um, at the crisis increasing in, in many countries. And uh, that also um, took us to the discussion around essential goods and essential services. And that is something that is coming up uh, at OECD level. We see uh, this debate starting now, and uh, I will be curious to understand how this debate will evolve with uh, the different political uh, sensitivities and considerations amongst uh, many OECD countries. But uh, the OECD is willing to, uh, to start this debate. What does it mean essential goods? What does it mean essential services? And uh, how we can um, build on these essential goods and services, not to bring back, uh, let's say, inshore and nationalism and, and uh, um, shift production, but uh, making sure that global value chains are uh, still uh, uh, of value and uh, that we can deal with uh, this changing uh, environment. Uh, in the next slide, I bring you um, some of the responses taken by countries and many of them were already anticipated by the previous speakers. So in terms of emergency contracting, we saw uh, OECD countries um, trying to um, uh, provide support to, to the public buyers, but also enhancing the transparency and uh, even, uh, even uh, creating dedicated uh, portals for uh, advertising uh, COVID-19 related contracts, trying to bring additional accountability to direct contracting, which was also something very interesting to see. Uh, we saw also uh, new ways of, of managing uh, public contracts and, and concessions due to the change in demand levels and that forced uh, many countries to uh, sit uh, virtually, most likely, with uh, the suppliers and, uh, and um, understand with them what were the, the key dimensions that need to be considered in terms of contract management. And this is something that uh, I believe it will uh, also stay. Uh, for the future. And um, that engagement, uh, the market engagement, um, we saw a lot of uh, um, dialogue uh, between the, the public sector and, and the market, trying to find uh, alternative and innovative solutions, but also looking at the supply chain. And this understanding of the supply chain was something that was clearly missing from the um, uh, public uh, buyer. So the Buyer was uh, staying at, let's say, tier one, tier two of the supply. Interesting to see that um, now countries are looking deeper into the supply chain and they are also uh, somehow bringing additional dimensions to the procurement process. In the next uh, uh, public procurement week, uh, OECD public procurement week in October, we are going to present um, uh, our report on responsible business conduct and um, uh, public procurement that uh, is looking at the way uh, OECD countries are uh, bringing uh, responsible business conduct considerations into the procurement process, trying to reduce uh, child labor, you know, uh, inappropriate working conditions and uh, unethical behavior. So I think uh, clearly there are new dimensions that uh, procurement people are looking at and uh, the post-COVID-19 world will be certainly different for uh, many of us. And um, uh, last dimension that I would like you to consider is the digitalization um, of the uh, procurement process that is now, of course, uh, it was speed up, it was extended, and uh, now all countries are looking at uh, digitalized ways to conduct their procurement. So the next slide brings me to a um, few of the things that from the, oh, oh, the OECD side, we believe they will continue. And uh, I think they resonate quite well with um, the parts that the, the book uh, was, was coming uh, and uh, Chris already walked us through the different uh, chapters of the book. 
my chapter is chapter 13, a lucky number for me. I was born on the 13th of August, so also uh, an interesting um, combination. And uh, I'm not here, unfortunately, to talk about uh, our chapter, which was on evaluation of uh, systems using the MAPS methodology. Um, I just wanted to, to, to show how the, the book anticipated these approaches, and you will see in the next slides, uh, the next couple of slides have these dimensions that I was talking about. So if, Chris, you could move to the next slide. We think that there are uh, several um, initiatives that were developed or maybe even strengthened during the, the COVID-19 crisis that uh, will impact public procurement go going forward. Uh, first of all, the transparency. Um, so this record keeping, this publishing of uh, different types of contracts might be even applied to different things. Uh, of course, the use of digital tools to set up uh, transparency and accountability tools like uh, central price and supplier tracking portals and things like that will definitely be of use. And um, what I mentioned about the, the supply chain verification and this um, In the next slide, I will continue to bring you these uh, country initiatives that are uh, impacting uh, OECD um, countries in terms of their procurement processes. So the dialogue with the market, I already mentioned that to you. Um, in many countries, mostly Anglo-Saxon countries like Australia, UK, New Zealand, uh, it was easier for them because of the legal framework, of course, to, um, to sit with the suppliers and uh, understand how they could improve uh, the, the ongoing contracts. For other more rigid, let's say, legal frameworks, it will be a bit more challenging. But even in these countries, we found uh, interesting examples that are reflected in our report um, about the policy responses. The question of uh, local and regional supply chains, which I think it will be of interest to understand the, the balance and how these uh, regional uh, supply chains that uh, were developed will be compliant with the free trade agreements or uh, the principles of market openness and competition that we all, uh, I think, uh, uh, support. Um, then, of course, uh, we saw uh, after the initial, uh, let's say, clashes between the different public buyers uh, in um, the same country fighting for the same products and services, we saw the, the emerging of uh, the, some cooperative and collaborative approaches. And uh, that, I think, it's something that will stay. And uh, I think uh, our countries are much more prepared now to react to such situations, even at, the, uh, let's say, a supranational level, like the Commission and the vaccine example, I think it was clear in that sense. Um, this debate around essential goods and services that I already mentioned to you um, is something that uh, I will be quite interested to, to follow up. And of course, the importance of uh, using uh, data for uh, understanding the trends in emergency contracting. So basically, this was what I would like to share with you today. I hope you found it um, sufficiently attractive to read both the, the reports we put forward, but also coming back to the book. I think the book has a wealth of uh, information there and ideas that are uh, going to help us uh, navigate these uh, troubled waters. So the next slide will have the, um, uh, the links to the, uh, our sites. So, uh, well, there was one slide more, <laughs> but I think I already uh, mentioned uh, this question. So thank you. Thank you very much, Paolo. Paolo, can I ask you a couple questions? Is that okay? So one is on many of the people who are on this call are academics engaged in research. Um, and, I, and I'm working with Justin Kaufman on, a, on research at the state level of what happened, the response to the pandemic. If, we, um, if one does interviews um, of people who were involved, um, because of the political sensitivity of what happened, um, there is, it, the, the research becomes very complicated and very difficult because of issues of confidentiality and sensitivity. The alternative approach seems to be the approach that you took, which is to hold a series of public webinars and just trust the public actors to be sufficiently forthcoming about the problems that they were encountering to put those problems out on the table. Do you think that, that the webinar approach 
you essentially a, a public discourse approach. Do you think that that worked effectively as a research tool? Uh, I think so. We managed to bring different levels of government to the webinars. We included, for instance, uh, federal states in Germany to the discussion, trying to understand how the states were dial uh, the dialogue with the, the national governments. So I think it's a, it's a good approach. Another approach is to entrust, uh, let's say, independent um, and reliable uh, organizations that could um, create this uh, atmosphere for the, the state level to share more uh, information like we did with, with Germany precisely. We managed to uh, get a lot of information from the state level that the national level never had access because we conducted a very important review of the public procurement system in Germany, for instance. Okay. So the, the second question I have for you has to do with export controls um, and, and import controls. The, the United States is um, embarking on an effort to onshore essential medicines so that we in the United States will do the production. Many people think that that's practically impossible to onshore the production processes at this point because of the international supply chain. It also raises obvious questions, which is we, 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 we failed on a national stockpile because we were preparing for a terrorist attack. If we onshore the essential medicines for the next pandemic and the next the next disaster, just to, just to put in reference, Secretary Mattis, it turned out a book that came out last week, Secretary Mattis a year ago was sleeping in his clothes because he was convinced there was gonna be a nuclear attack from North Korea, okay? He was sleeping in his clothes. It was that close a risk. If that is in fact the risk, if the risk is a nuclear attack, if we prepare for a pandemic, we'll be completely unprepared. So having, Import and export constraints, as Simon Evan at, at the University of St. Gallens has pointed out, is very, very dangerous. It, is there any serious discussion about limiting export and import controls regarding, in, under trade agreements, limiting import and export controls regarding essential supplies? It's a very interesting question, and uh, I'm sure that there is no single answer to that. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, we are now starting this debate around essential goods. And um, I, I'm afraid that, you know, you mentioned the U.S. position. I'm curious to see how the U.S. will react to this discussion on essential goods. And then if the OECD can come up with an agreement, what does it mean an essential good? And does it mean it needs to be produced in the country or not? So um, I think it's, uh, and you mentioned the, where the next... Uh, disaster will occur from, where it will come from. We don't know, you know, no one would anticipate a pandemic as such like one year ago. So I, I think it's important to understand the, the, the different dimensions to create uh, frameworks, but maybe instead of um, trying to, to promote these export import bans, it's, it would be better to um, have uh, access to the supply chain and to have a collaboration that will allow you to keep the supply chains open when the situations occur. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carla. With that, I will turn it over to Stefan. Stefan? Hi, hello everybody. Interesting to me. Um, so thank you very much for um, inviting me to this uh, book uh, uh, discussion. Um, I, I, want, I just want to, to pay um, a tribute to, uh, to all the authors and the, the director also for, um, for the book, as I am deeply convinced that this, um, uh, these books uh, fill, um, uh, fill a gap. Uh, uh, we had either a very um, uh, legal uh, analysis on public procurement uh, based on the uh, analysis of rules. Either we have uh, uh, economical analysis of public procurement uh, or management analysis of public procurement. And, and then I think we have something, uh, a book which combine all, all the glances. Uh, so um, it's a very uh, uh, welcome uh, collection of chapters that we, we have in this book on uh, cross-border procurement and, um, and innovation. And uh, in my opinion, the, the book uh, brings uh, real um, uh, added value on at least uh, three points. Uh, the first one, as Chris say, is to, uh, to combine a European view, uh, American view, and also a third country view, as we have also a chapter from uh, Asia and uh, Egypt. And before uh, reading the book, I had no idea about uh, <laughs> Egyptian law and uh, something which happened in, uh, in the Cairo. 
know about public procurement. So uh, it's a real added value on that um, on um, on that side. Um, the the other point is that, as uh, Paolo said in this slide, uh, I'm deeply convinced that the book um, anticipated uh, issues uh, that we uh, are now at the deep in the front line of uh, public procurement uh, lawyers. Uh, this question of uh, of uh, innovation, uh, this uh, uh, question of uh, derogatory rules to uh, some uh, uh, specific supplies, um, uh, this question of controlling gen general interest uh, are now very in the heart, in the spotlight of public procurement. And we have yet this question of the book, which was published, I, I want to, to remind it, uh, one year ago, so before the, the, COVID, the COVID crisis. And the other point is that the book rightly, rightly stresses on a concrete um, example. It, it starts from the ground. Uh, that's very interesting. And so it's, um, uh, it's a bottom-up approach. It, it comes from, from the ground. And from the ground, it, um, the book tries to uh, analyze, to go more in deep uh, about the, the applicability and the relevancy of the existing rules, rather in the US, rather in uh, the uh, European uh, Union. So uh, uh, obviously, I don't have the time to discuss to discuss all all the book, uh, and uh, I don't have also all the, the, the knowledge to discuss all the the question which are raised in in the book. So um, for this discussion, um, I only want to um, to highlight to stress on the the point about uh, cost cost procurement about the the, the question of cost procurement and um, the the discrepancy. Uh, between the rules uh, applying to cross procurement and the uh, reality of the of the implementation M maybe chris can, can we can we switch about the um, the slide please uh, okay well <laughs> next one so uh, in my in my point of view the the book rightly stresses on the, the diversity of um, meaning of, um, of cross-border procurement because this qualification of cross-border procurement uh, is very um, is very general is like an, an umbrella concept an umbrella concept and then we need typology uh, we need to establish typology and when we read the book we have a typology or we have an example of typology of cross procurement between uh, uh, cross procurement a single entity uh, in which two member states are joining or uh, a, a joint procurement two member state together without a single entity or also the, the um, the use of a central purchasing body established in a member state uh, from which or to which another member state uses resources. So here we have a typology and uh, this typology can be also um, understood with um, institutional uh, instrument such as in Europe, the uh, European uh, grouping or European structure of uh, territorial cooperation. And uh, this question of, um, of cross-border uh, procurement appears in several contributions of the book, for instance, in the introduction and also in chapter three and in chapter four of, of the book. And maybe to, uh, to, to follow with is this um, uh, introductory uh, remarks, uh, we can say that this question of uh, joint procurement uh, became central with um, the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. And we can refer to the guidance of the European Commission, uh, which has been published uh, is the first April of this, uh, of this year. And in the guidance of the, com of the Commission, the Commission, um, stresses on the need to uh, use joint procurement between member states for uh, medical uh, supply uh, in the situation related to the, to the COVID. But we can yet say that um, uh, despite this reference of the Commission to uh, uh, joint procurement in this uh, guidance, uh, we have uh, uh, poor um, uh, uh, elements of concrete application of this uh, joint medical supply in this document of this of the use guidance. So, uh, in order to, to follow, Chris, can, can we can can we switch? I just would like to uh, to stress on the. Um, 
the discrepancy uh, between uh, the content of the rule and the uh, application and concrete example of cross uh, cooperation by using two uh, examples, two topical uh, examples to uh, uh, exemplify the, the demonstration. The first example is the, the, the question of the EGTC, uh, Euro European Grouping of Territorial Cooperation, um, uh, Groupement Européen de Coopération Territoriale, European Grouping of Territorial Cooperation, which has been established in 2006 uh, with a new regulation in uh, 2013. As we know, uh, EGTC um, is both a, a legal instrument and a legal entity as itself, uh, which uh, a legal personality, uh, which is designed to uh, facilitate and to uh, promote cross-border, transnational and interregional cooperation. Formally, we have a, a real success of the, of the tool as at the current stage, we have uh, 77 uh, EGTC uh, CGCT uh, in uh, Europe and, and we have uh, a list of uh, EGTC which is uh, uh, established by the uh, region committee uh, in, in Brussels. And these entities are very diverse uh, in terms of country. Uh, this entity also covers third countries. For instance, you can have EGTCs between uh, um, Eastern country and um, um, uh, country like uh, Ukraine, for, for, for instance, and also diverse in terms of uh, uh, mission, very general mission or very close mission of uh, transportation, uh, environment, uh, or um, also um, uh, care and health care, for instance, an hospital between France and, and, and Spain. And what is interesting is that it, the, the directive 2014-24 uh, um, and uh, at Article 39 uh, lay down um, um, a specific provision uh, which um, uh, recognize a real leeway for member states to uh, determine the law applying to such uh, transnational entity when such entity conclude a public contract either public procurement, marché public, or either um, uh, concession. Uh, we have a real leeway. This leeway is rightly demonstrated and analyzed in the, in the book in several chapters. And we have the impression that this provision of the directive establishes a, a form of uh, forum shopping, of law shopping, uh, in the meaning that a member state can uh, cho choose uh, the law applying, either the law where uh, the establishment is established, either the law where the contract is uh, executed, either a, a mix, a, a mix of, the, of the law. So, uh, um, undoubtedly, uh, we have through this provision uh, a friendly, uh, a friendly env environment, and this expression of friendly environment is used at the beginning of the of the of the book. But uh, I just wanted to, Chris, can you just uh, go on? I just wanted to uh, to see how this. Uh, um, uh, this uh, virtual uh, form of uh, uh, cross cooperation is uh, concretely applied. How it is applied on the um, on the ground, and in order to to prepare the the discussion, um, I made um, a research on the the TAID database, the tender online uh, from the official journal, with the keyword uh, EGCT or uh, CGOT uh, in French to to look at. Um, a specific uh, notice uh, notices from such entity. Do we have concretely notice tendering from uh, such transnational entity? And when we we, we develop such, such such research, the the result is quite uh, poor, uh, meaning that on the last seven years, so from uh, 2013, we have only 25 contract notice for all the European uh, cooperation group, uh, 25 uh, during the seven last year is, is poor, coming always from the same entity. So always we have three or four the same European grouping entity. So to um, 
uh, two in France, one, one in Italy, in Gorizza, and uh, also the, the hospital of Cerdania between France, France and, uh, and Spain, uh, one near the, the place of Jean Bernard, Aquitaine, Euskadi, Euro region. But uh, there are the, the, the most part of the EGCT in Eastern Europe, in Northern Europe, in the thoroughs of Europe, don't use uh, tendering, and you won't find in TED tenders from such. Uh, from such an entity. And if you have a look at the content of the notices which are published by uh, this entity, you have very basic needs or similar needs, needs of communication, needs of marketing, um, needs of uh, interpretation, which is quite logical because of the linguistic uh, situation, but you won't find uh, any uh, strong contract of, of uh, uh, dealing with public war contract or dealing, dealing with concession, well, dealing with a, a strong dimension of, uh, of, public, um, of public procurement. So it, to, to, it, it, um, to my mind, um, I, I wonder, well, if, um, as I return in the slide, if the, the, the mountain labor and uh, brought forth uh, for a mouth, a mouse, uh, meaning that if we don't have a, a huge uh, discrepancy between the text and, and, and the reality and the concrete implementation of uh, uh, this uh, virtual uh, transnational public procurement. And obviously we can raise several questions. Either we don't have any contract for such entities, or if they are contract, the contracts are so low that they are below the free sold uh, of tendering and, that, and then they don't appear in the European database. So that means that they are very basic and small contract or uh, a third uh, response or reflection we can share is that maybe these entity don't have sufficient uh, legal competence, uh, legal attribution to conclude uh, um, a strong public contract in the field of healthcare, in the field of transportation, um, in the field of uh, environment, well, in any field of public policy. So we cannot disconnect this question of uh, law applying to cross-border procurement and the reality, the extension of competence and power which are um, devoted to these transnational, transnational um, um, entities. So, and to end with this first, first consideration, um, the book uh, appears to me as a, a real toolbox to understand all the rules applying to transnational public procurement uh, agreement. Uh, and we need this toolbox. Maybe, maybe we should follow it by uh, a real empirical research to, to understand how concretely it is, where are these uh, transnational entity and how these transnational entity uh, apply or not apply this, um, this, this toolbox. So this is my, my first consideration. The other one, Chris, is uh, about the, can, can we, uh, thank you, is about the question of joint procurement for, um, for medical uh, uh, supply. So, um, uh, in the official, uh, in the official uh, discourse from the European uh, Commission, we, 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 ha we had uh, in March, and we still have, uh, a strong uh, insistence on uh, common public procurement. And if you have a look again at the COVID-19 uh, uh, um, uh, communication uh, of last uh, April, uh, we have a very strong insistence on the fact that the commission together with the state uh, stepped before by launching joint procurement for uh, medical supply. So, uh, mask, uh, test, uh, ventilators, and maybe medical equipments. And on the other, on the other dimension, uh, the book rightly stresses on the fact that we have in the directive uh, a legal base, which is very often quoted by many contributors, Article uh, 39 of the directive, which say that contracting authority by different member states can, can, may act jointly in the award of public procurement by using one of the means provided in this article. And there are 
three main ways or means, uh, which are frame, framework agreement or uh, European groupment, I spoke just before, or uh, a central purchasing body in a member state. But the interesting thing, Chris, can you can we go on? The interesting thing is that this article, Article 39, are not been used in the context of the COVID pandemic. No? So the, the provision of the directive remain uh, 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 silent as a legal base in the context of the, um, uh, of the pandemic. If you have a look uh, concretely at the um, um, joint uh, agreement or the joint procurement, which has been endorsed by the, the commission, we, you will find that you have two main legal bases which had been used in order to have this joint agreement for medical supply. On the one hand, you have um, a decision uh, which is decision uh, 1082 uh, 2013 on serious cross-border threat to health, um, which had established in 2013 a joint procurement procedure in the context of the influenza of the H, uh, H1N1 uh, influenza for medical uh, contempt measure. No? This uh, decision is not um, uh, legally based on the directive of, of public procurement, but is legally, legally based on the uh, competence of the EU on um, uh, health care. So we have a form of lex specialis, which has been used for this um, uh, uh, common purchasing of medical uh, supply and not the lex generalis, which should should uh, should have been used as Article 39 of the of the directive, and the other point I want to stress is um, we had also uh, in April uh, 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 a regulation endorsed by the Council, Regulation 2020 um, 521 of 13 of April, um, regulation which is not based on public procurement and which is not based on legal market or competition law, but it, which is based on Article one, um, 122 TFEU, which is emergency measures related to uh, uh, economic policy, related to the, chap to the chapter on economic policy of the EU and not uh, the internal market and not competition law. Hey, if you have a look, Chris, can, can we follow? If you have a look to this uh, regulation of last uh, April, uh, again, you have a toolbox of joint procurement, but which is not the toolbox of the Common Directive 2014, which is another toolbox of, of joint procurement and saying that you can have um, a major, um, emergency joint uh, procurement on three legal different bases, either um, joint procurement which are based on the financial regulation of the, of the EU. Uh, so uh, in that case, the legal base is not the directive, but the financial regulation if the EU, uh, meaning that the rules applying to public contract of EU institution which imply the use of EU budget and specific requirements for such uh, public procurement. Either you have another ground, which is um, an, a kind of specific of ad hoc procurement between the commission acting on behalf of the member state on the agreement. And in this hypothesis, the commission act as we can say as a mandataire of the, of, the, of, the, of the member state uh, in the framework of uh, ad hoc agreement, but with no reference to the directive. And at least um, uh, you have also procurement by the commission acting as a wholesaler. wholesaler um, there are students from my university which are listening, we, we, like an uh, entrepôt, uh, wholesaler, which uh, uh, with, uh, stocks uh, goods and medical uh, things, uh, including rentals to, uh, to member states. And that's very interesting because in the emergency context of COVID, we, we saw that the institution developed again another toolbox, which is quite close, but legally and formally different from the one of the, of the general uh, directive for such common uh, procurement for, for medical supplies. This only applies for, for medical supply in the context of, um, of COVID. But um, in any cases, and 
to, to end with this presentation. Uh, I, I just wonder um, uh, whether, Chris, just to, to conclude, uh, uh, that we, uh, obviously, at least in Europe, we have a difficulty to, to find and to establish um, a, a common uh, normative uh, framework for um, um, cross-border procurement. Um, it appears more than a, a, a cobweb of rules and a cobweb of evol uh, evolving rules, which are not stable from such cross procurement rather, rather than a clear book and a stable book of, um, of rules. Second point, as I explained, um, I consider that uh, we have obviously um, a real discrepancy between the legal base, the flexibility of the rules, the potentiality of the tool, because there are potentiality in all these tools and the books very well explores all this possibility and the practical, the concrete implementation. Um, and maybe I wonder uh, a, a friendly environment to, to use uh, the formula of the book is a prerequisite, but is not sufficient. Um, and maybe that shows that we need a, a common administrative culture. We need also convergences in the practices of processing. And that also uh, say what the the colleague of the uh, United Nations say before that the, the, glance, uh, the glances of procurement are not uh, sufficient to foster this uh, um, uh, common and cross, uh, and cross uh, procurement. There are also uh, uh, cultural, political, linguistic consideration which are um, obviously at, uh, at stake. And um, also to finish, um, it's more to open, um, the, the recent, the, the, the current uh, crisis of, of COVID uh, shows obviously um, uh, a, tempt, uh, a temptation to uh, to tighten to to have um, uh, uh, a pure national uh, vision of this issue of uh, of public uh, of public purchase, uh, uh, sometimes by endorsing uh, legal rules or um, uh, legal adaptation, which are purely national and that could be not fully consistent with uh, with uh, e e uh, EU law. Uh, so uh, I'm deeply convinced that the current situation of COVID is clearly like uh, always a case of crisis, um, uh, a context, a proper context to uh, strengthen this reflection on concrete uh, uh, application of cross procurement. Thank you, and thank you again for the invitation. Great, thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and sorry for the accent from, uh, from Paris. <laughs> Chris, uh, Chris, Chris if, if I can uh, just thank uh, all, all the present, the, the discussion that uh, give us a lot of idea for the next book <laughs> and for the next cooperation with uh, all of you for going deeper in what you said and starting from Stefan I just uh, uh, some word and uh, what you explain and discuss uh, shows really and uh, uh, grow my my my, my deep uh, uh, belief in uh, cooperation and joint procurement. Obviously, as you said, it's uh, the, the, the way to, uh, to reach this is long. So we need the time to develop this uh, uh, culture of administrative cooperation also among uh, uh, different member states of, uh, of Europe, also Italy and France, for example. We, we had all this project that was a pilot project on cooperation, but now we have to develop it uh, quicker and the pandemic uh, um, helps us to go in this direction because we saw that when we national procurement closes down and uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's really risky and uh, for, for everybody so we have to open and use this uh, challenge to go uh, quicker over the, the idea of uh, overcoming the, the the limits and the difficulties of cooperation obviously the, as you as you describe, uh, also for the, the JPA, so the Joint Ag uh, Procurement Agreement uh, that was uh, acted uh, under the financial regulation, didn't work so well. So even uh, having overcome the leg legal barrier of uh, uh, having uh, the financial regulation, but then the cooperation doesn't didn't work. And uh, I think because there wasn't uh, in place uh, procurement expert. That's why I really look forward to working with uh, procurement expert with the community of. Bank 
buyers because uh, they know how we're dealing with the market, they know the, the supply chain, they, they should share this, uh, this knowledge to help and to, um, to face this crisis. So as uh, also Paolo uh, said and uh, recalled, Paolo Magina, uh, we need uh, to know better the market, the supply chain, and uh, to know better the, the world of the undertakings that uh, are suppliers. And, uh, and we realize that uh, often this is not there. And in the book, as, uh, as you told us, uh, we discussed the innovation and all the issue on innovation and the meaning and also the, the, the flexible notion of innovation as Carolina outlined. Uh, and this is uh, really an issue because uh, uh, we, uh, we link the joint procurement that is difficult with innovation that is difficult. So we try to, do, um, to, to, to go deeper this, uh, this idea. But anyway, we can also um, use the, the, the lines of the book to, to show and to describe how we can also uh, split the, the step. And also, as uh, Roseanne told us in, in uh, Innovation Partnership, Innovation Partnership puts together research and development, uh, um, pre-commercial procurement, innovation procurement. So it's really difficult uh, also in this uh, perspective. And if we, we um, want to do Innovation Partnership through a joint procurement or cross-border procurement, we sum up all the difficulties of procurement issues. So really we, we need to, 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 to take uh, little step by step and going uh, uh, to, 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 to testing and to practice this uh, experience and this, uh, this uh, possibility of developing innovation through, uh, the, the, in, the few, in the next years and uh, uh, by uh, step by step. And so uh, pleased to know that in France we have some cases of innovation partnership. We don't have much yet, but uh, really because we realize uh, how it's uh, difficult to link all these uh, steps uh, uh, together. So I think we will have um, time and maybe a, a possible uh, initiative on a book on, on this perspective. And especially what links all, all the intervention, and I think it's uh, the, the, the new uh, the, the new idea of, we want to work on is really artificial, uh, artificial intelligence and digitalization. As Paolo recalled and all of you recalled, we need to make this uh, step uh, towards the digitalization of procurement, a full digitalization also for work procurement that becomes a kind of service with the uh, prediction of when the window will, uh, will uh, crash in the next 10 years and that's all a, a new perspective on procurement. And this is an issue also for relating to the, the, the supplier and the undertaking and the, the, um, the great uh, uh, gap we have uh, uh, and because our procuring agency and also our central purchasing bodies are still not ready to uh, to do all this uh, this, uh, this new uh, dealing with the market in a, a fully digital way and that's why the idea that Chris shared with you at the beginning that uh, we we are we would risk to lose our subject matter if we if we uh, won't uh, fight for a public procurement uh, um, policy and public procurement law in the next year and we won't let it to the private sector to deal with uh, all the sourcing uh, for for the state so that's really the um, the, the issue i think it's really important to uh, to have clear that it's much difficult and much risky uh, to, to have a public agency that buys, but it's really important and from the European perspective, even much more than maybe in the American perspective to, um, to keep the public function of uh, procurement function as a public one for defining the public policy and industrial policy that we need also, and especially when we have to face uh, emergency, pandemic, all, uh, all these kind of uh, issues. So I really thank you very much, uh, all of you, because it was a great pleasure to hear you and to, have, and to share your idea. And uh, looking forward to working uh, with you for the next book. <laughs> so thank you very much. To all. I leave it to Chris. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Laurence and Jean Bernard. Uh, Laurence and Jean Bernard, would you like to provide some observations? 
Um, yes. Um, I actually changed the background of uh, uh, behind my camera just to show you that I'm currently in Africa, in Dakar, and also to give you some perspective on the book and on your comments uh, relating to the situation in Africa. Uh, it could be a little bit surprising that this uh, book, which is really in advance and going forward, looking for innovation in public procurement, uh, is actually really relevant in the context of, uh, of Africa. Uh, first of all, because, um, well, I prepared a chapter on smart cities. I prepared that with uh, Peter Tretti. Uh, we both work on the comparison between American and French uh, smart cities initiatives. Uh, but smart cities could seem to be on hold because of the uh, pandemic situation, but that's not the case at all. Uh, these type of uh, projects are actually still going on. And just to give you some example in, uh, in Senegal, they are actually building a new capital. And the new capital will be a smart city. And it's already uh, built. Uh, it's uh, 20 kilometers from Dakar. And uh, they have a lot of uh, ambition regarding this, uh, this project. And of course, legal issues regarding a smart city project are there as well. Uh, there is also a very interesting initiative of a private smart city um, based on a lease, uh, a 50 years lease, which will be, which is already signed between the government and uh, Senegalo-American uh, uh, singer, uh, in a, rap, a rapper singer, I guess, which he, who is Akon. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with, <laughs> with this guy, but is there with the idea of financing a new uh, smart city uh, on the beach, it's a beach resort, and you want to attract a lot of investment in this area. And of course, my question when I read things like that in the press is about the legal background which is behind, and we don't have a lot of information on that. So there are some uh, projects going on in Africa, and not only in Senegal about smart cities, but there are also other very interesting uh, elements in the book uh, that I really praise. For example, discussion about internet uh, purchasing through uh, things like uh, Amazon.gov. And um, again, there are some initiatives in Africa, but having uh, some sort of Amazon.gov. Uh, just yesterday, I heard about a Saudi a company uh, which is now uh, uh, trying to get contracts with uh, several African governments in order to organize a sort of uh, private supply chain online for COVID uh, products, goods. So there are initiatives in that area and again, raising a lot of legal issues. And finally, the book is also very interesting with all the elements we just mentioned during the discussion, and there were a lot of very interesting comments from all of you guys, uh, specifically Stefan, who raised a lot of issue about uh, this type of arrangement. Um, but uh, the other comments were also very interesting. I don't have enough time to talk about them, but uh, joint procurement is also a main concern. Yesterday, I attended, I attended an online uh, conference uh, between um, 16 uh, regulatory bodies, uh, French-speaking regulatory bodies in Africa. And they are members of a huge network. It's the biggest in the world, actually, uh, covering 54 regulatory procurement regulatory bodies in Africa. And they are thinking about the future the future of their development and the future of using public procurement as a tool in order to, uh, of course, not only tackle the, the, the COVID crisis, but also uh, to introduce a more sustainable development. And so they ask a lot of questions about joint procurement initiative in Europe. They are interested in this. They want to see if they can have something similar, at least at the level of the uh, UEMOA, Union Économique et Monétaire de l'Ouest Africain, or YMU in English. So Senegal, uh, Ivory Coast, and uh, countries uh, on the west part of Africa. And uh, 
So they were asking, how we, can we actually, they're asking me, how can we actually have such a thing? And I was a little bit, uh, <laughs> little bit um, speechless because actually when we look at the, the European examples, as you mentioned, uh, well, on paper, they might work, but uh, on the practical side, there's still a lot of progress to, to make. So, uh, and they asked me this relevant question about, but if we decide to create a central purchasing body, what kind of law will apply if we decide to have a joint procurement agreement among two or three African countries, what kind of law will apply? So they are really in the same discussions and it's, it's a shame, I have to say, that the book does not exist in French. We should have a French version of the book because there were a lot of questions coming from all these uh, regulatory bodies. And, um, and I tried to answer all of these questions, but I think there's still a lot of work to, to do. So I think at the end of the day, um, it raised a lot of questions. The issue of choice of law definitely is one question which usually does not belong to the uh, public contracts law area. It's an international private business question, the choice of law. And so we have also to borrow from other fields in order to find solutions and answers in that type of questions. And as it was mentioned, and that will be the, the, my last word, um, all of these call for more harmonization. Of course, and it was mentioned by Stefan as well, we cannot have such a tool uh, working if the systems are so different. Legal system and also the way people use these legal rules. So what you call actually, what the permission called a friendly environment is actually a harmonized environment. So uh, I think we still have a lot to do in that direction, uh, but definitely uh, the relevance of the book is obvious and uh, we need even more in that uh, direction for innovation in public procurement. So thank, I really thank uh, Gabriella and Chris for inviting me and participating in this book, in this initiative. Uh, it was uh, not only interesting, but really, really rewarding. And, uh, and I thank Peter Trepti as well. I know he's there uh, for his collaboration. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lawrence. Um, Jean Bernard, did you want to make a few observations? Yes, thanks, Chris. Um, we were very glad to welcome this book in, into the, the series because it's uh, really, as uh, some of you said, uh, a very, uh, very interesting and uh, useful book. After some months and or maybe one year, we have not changed our, our mind. Um, still, we are still very happy to have it in the in the, in the in the series. We have learned learned very much from the book. We have also learned from this afternoon's discussion, and we have also realized that ahead of us there are some issues we will have to deal with. Maybe in an, another book, I don't know. Uh, at least in uh, our common research. Uh, in this respect, I would like to, to make um, two couples of comments. The first one uh, is, is, is about the um, two, two couples of comments concerning these issues which, which are ahead of us. Um, the first couple is about the transborder aspects. Firstly, we realize very much, if we were not aware of that, the importance of the issue of the law applicable. Very important. And I would just add that we, we try to be conscious, we, we, we start to be conscious that we will not solve, or it will be difficult to solve this issue by simply saying, well, uh, we will choose one of the national uh, laws in the context and it will cover the whole issue. That is not true because, um, because there are things at the edges uh, before the, ma the, the, the making of the contract itself. There are procedures, administrative procedures, 
administrative authorities of, of the, the different uh, states involved. And there are issues, there are procedures after, during the, the, the operation of the, of the contract. And we, we cannot say, well, all this will be covered by the one of, of, the, of the law, because it's uh, simply, practically, and politically, I would say, uh, uh, impossible. So we are really uh, in front of a question which I will characterize as a transnational administrative law uh, question. Uh, some people are uh, uh, working very much on, of it, on it, including in a neighboring network that we, we have called um, uh, transnational administrative law, uh, precisely. Um, my, my second comment about the, the transborder issue is to um, take upon what uh, Stefan said uh, about the, the quasi absence of any uh, uh, common uh, procurement, joint procurement within the uh, European groupings of uh, uh, territorial cooperation. Uh, that is very surprising because apparently it, it should be the best possible context for such a, 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 a cooperation. Um, you have people, um, people, territorial entities, um, which are, have uh, some habit of working together and a high degree of trust in one another. That could, should be normally an ideal context for developing joint procurement. Um, I suggest to uh, simply ask some of them, what, have you um, considered the possibility of making common contracts? And why did you uh, uh, renounce to, 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 to do so? Um, my other comments about, are about the um, innovation aspect, so important as well. Um, uh, I have a question, um, um, oh, I, I would like to um, put on the table a question uh, on which I believe uh, some more work should be done. It's about the use of algorithms in, in, the, in the making of, in the procurement, in the future uh, processes of uh, uh, procurement. Because personally, I'm not, I have not um, clearly figured out uh, what the, the concrete uses, what are the concrete uses of algorithms in, in, in the context of procurement. Are they used for the definition of uh, the needs? Are they used for deciding where, when to buy? Um, are they used for detecting fraud, corruption, or, or whatever? Uh, whatever? Are they used for deciding uh, uh, which businesses are uh, uh, eligible? Are they used or will they be, they be used for the choice of the winning, uh, uh, the winning uh, business? I don't know. Are they, um, uh, probably they are available, potentially available for all these uh, purposes, but uh, of course, some of them especially will raise the, the, the issues, the use of algorithms in the public action, uh, generally speaking, uh, raises uh, transparency, judicial review, and so, and so on, and, and, and so, so forth. My last remark is about, is about smart cities. Of course, we, we, will, have, we will have to, to, to work and again on, on, on the contracts and, and the smart cities, uh, not only because um, smart cities are something which, which is developing. So we discover, every day we discover new uh, aspects of it. Um, my, my suggestion is that uh, probably one of the, of the key um, encounters between uh, smart cities and public contracts will be related data to data. The status of data, uh, the, um, uh, at, at least in two respects, I see 
problems concerning the circulation of data in, in uh, uh, the smart cities public infrastructure, which is more and more in, in, a, in, a, in a coordination status, in a coordination type of uh, organization with various entities involved. Okay? I could take e examples of, the, of uh, schemes, of smart city schemes in which you have several entities grouped in order to uh, manage the, the, the local infrastructure and data circulate. So this raise, uh, raises, of course, uh, circulates in a way, forget to, to add that, in a way which is partially, partially, but probably uncompletely uh, uh, subject to uh, contractual uh, provisions regulated by, by uh, contractual provisions. Uh, another aspect of the same issue is uh, something which appeared every day more as a strategic is issue in the development of smart cities, which is the pooling of data, pooling of data, uh, private and public. Everyone, everyone is conscious that the so-called smart cities will not be able to, to function properly if a means is not found in order to put together, you know, in order to make function together the oceans of data you have on, on the public side, more or less uh, organized in fact, in fact, but on the public side, and the oceans of data which, is, which are in, in private hands. And this, this will, will be a matter for contracts, I believe. These are the, co the comments I wanted to, to, to make. And um, I finish simply by uh, uh, thanking, um, uh, in fact, all of you, but especially um, uh, Gabriella and, and Chris, both for, for the book and for the uh, very interesting discussion of this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Jean Bernal. It's uh, all your merit if you, we are here. So thank you very much for uh, starting the series and going on. Thank you for your indulgence of the Americans with terrible French, Jean Bernard. My, my very, I very much hope that <laughs> in the next few years we'll have automatic captioning for these webinars so that we can conduct them in French and I can, <laughs> I can follow them. <laughs> in the next um, future, just, maybe. Before we, before we close out, I just want to acknowledge some of the folks who worked on the book. Mohammed, thank you very much for joining us as a co-author on the book. Um, Paula, um, we have as well um, uh, Peter McKean, who uh, worked on the book, and um, we had Justin Calvin before as an author. Carol Cabrera was, was very instrumental in helping move forward the book. Many, many authors worked on this book. Mohammed Ismail, too. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. So I think we've, we're out of time. Um, does anybody else have any other comments they'd like to make? Yeah. Okay. okay, super. We keep it so, for next time. We have a lot of ideas. So yeah. Just keep quickly, we have, we, have, we have a session on public procurement, green public procurement uh, on the 30th, September 30th. It's at 1500 um, Central European time. The information is on my website, Public Procurement International. And the same day on September 30th at um, 1600 Central European time, the World Bank is having a very interesting conference on debarment. Well, um, that's that the information on that is available on the World Bank website. With that, I'll go ahead and sign off. This, this recording takes a while to process. Uh, so it should be on YouTube in the next hour or two. And there'll be a link from the Public Procurement International website to the YouTube recording as well. Thank you all, have a good day. Great. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.